A couple weeks ago, I was looking up information on mid-90s collaboration software. Um, collaboration being stuff like WebEx, where you can connect to somebody else's computer and see what they're doing as they're doing it, so you can work on a problem together. You can collaborate over the internet. Now, you might guess that this is a new industry, but uh, unsurprisingly, since I'm saying this sentence, uh, it definitely isn't. It's been around for decades. Uh, in fact, there was an explosion of collaboration software in the mid 90s um, circa 1994 in fact there were a whole bunch of programs trying to beat webex to market you know 15 years ahead of schedule uh, i have a whole list of their dead trademarks here let me read these to you intel ProShare, ibm person to person smart technologies smart 2000 future labs talk show data beam farsight modus sync conference rtz virtual meeting fujitsu dtc world links vis vis and crosswise face to face I just about ran out of breath reading those. There was this Cambrian explosion of collaboration apps that provided uh, various capabilities up to and including full screen sharing, just like we have now. Uh, if you ask me how they pulled that off over 14.4K modems, I couldn't tell you. At any rate, I was looking everywhere to try and find information about these things and maybe even find the software itself. So I was looking on Google Books, on Internet Archive. Um, I was even looking on eBay to see if I could buy original boxed copies. But every one of these programs is just lost to time. I mean, they're gone, man. At the nadir of this process, I was on Internet Archive and I searched for one of these programs and all I got were like two PDFs about unrelated businesses, an episode of the Computer Chronicles, and then the same episode in French. I was so bummed at this point that I just gave up and I just clicked on the Computer Chronicles video and started watching it. And to my surprise, it was actually about this topic and had a whole bunch of the programs that I was looking for in it. Now, of course, the Computer Chronicles video was a preview from back when these programs were brand new. So it's not a comprehensive documentation of what they were like. So I still want to find all this software, but it was interesting viewing. You know, I got to see what a number of these did and how they were received by the early public. But then in the middle of it, there was something that grabbed my attention. All of a sudden, there's this guy on the screen that's got this tablet that he's poking at, and it's got a UI on it I don't recognize, and I'm like, I gotta know what this is. So I go straight to Google and start searching for it. I find no information about the device, which was called the HP OmniShare. So I go over to eBay on a whim, and I find one for $99. Here's that. This box is a much larger than I had anticipated when I ordered it. Uh, the device itself is actually not nearly as big, but let's go ahead and get this unpacked. I've actually been into this before, but I wanted to show you what the original shipping configuration looked like, because uh, this thing's in a kind of a nice box, all things considered. For instance, as soon as you open the box, it's got this rubric showing you how to unpack the thing, which is sort of a kind of an interesting touch for this era for 1994, which is when this thing came out. Seems kind of ahead of its time. So the first thing in here is this big cardboard tray it contains all the accessories. We'll get into those later. Then we've got the appliance itself and the tablet. So this little gray tower is the appliance itself. And the first thing you notice upon getting out of the box is that it doesn't sit flat on the bottom. Uh, and it turns out that's because there's this little rubber foot down here. And I thought that maybe the previous owner just stuck that on there on a whim, um, but there's actually a little alignment mark here. So I think that was supposed to be on there from the factory. And I'll show you why I think that is in a little bit. Now notice the uh, front of the machine is pretty basic. You've got uh, power and status lights. You have a mysterious button here with a sort of meaningless symbol. Uh, and then you've got a door here that reveals a pair of PCMCAA slots. There's also an infrared receiver and a badge here for AT&T audio span, which we'll figure into the story much later. The back of the machine uh, also has a, a very appliance-like look to it. Uh, we've got an ethernet port, a serial port, parallel port, um, this funky port here for the tablet itself, uh, and then modem jacks. What you'll notice it doesn't have is any standard PC ports on it. It doesn't have a keyboard, mouse port, normal VGA, anything that would suggest that this is based on PC hardware. And that is a lot of why I wanted to get this thing. When I saw it in the Computer Chronicles video, I saw the GUI was completely unique. And I thought, well, what if this is some bespoke Motorola 68K machine with like a completely homegrown operating system and software on it? You know, this could be the last thing of its type in the world. I better grab this quick and find out if it's something really special. Well, we'll investigate that question later, but first uh, let's look at the rest of the machine. Next, we've got the tablet. Uh, it has a pen groove up here. It's got controls for brightness and contrast. You have to operate with the stylus. Uh, and then on the back, you've got these two flip out legs, which allow it to sit at a nice comfortable angle. The cord here has a mini Centronics plug on it. Definitely a proprietary connection, but who's surprised? All right, now let's look at the accessory kit. Uh, so first off, we've got the manuals, uh, both the installation guide, which is like the full user manual, uh, warranty, and then the quick guide, which is just how to turn it on and get it started. 
Then uh, we've got a driver disc, and we'll talk more about what's on there later, because it's interesting that you need drivers at all for this thing. We've obviously got IEC cable for power. There is a serial cable uh, for connection to a modem. Uh, then you've got just uh, your basic telephone cord. Then we've got a box uh, containing the stylus, which we'll see in greater detail later. Finally, uh, we've got the stands. Let me put everything else away and show you how those work. So there's two parts to the stand. Uh, first, uh, we've got the main base itself, which we can set the main system unit in, like yay. And then uh, the tablet is meant to go in the other side here, but if you just set it in the slot here, it just kind of falls out. Instead, you're supposed to take this clip here and put it in that slot, after which we can then put the tablet in like yay. And then you've got this nice compact storage location for this thing, so it's not taking up a whole bunch of space with the tablet out on your desk. Now this is, uh, I suspect, the reason that the main system unit has that rubber foot on the bottom, is I think HP was trying to irritate you into using the stand correctly. Because if you were to put the tablet in here with the clip by itself, I suspect it would more easily tip over. But you're gonna get that foot and be like, I can't get it off, I guess I'll just put it in the stand and weight it down so that it doesn't flip over. I'm just guessing, but I can't think why else they would have done that. That clip is actually a more interesting thing because what it actually is, if you pull it out of here, is it's a stand that allows you to use the tablet in an upright position. So you can put it down like that, and these little feet hold the thing up so you can use it vertically instead of laying down on the surface. So this is a, a neat feature, but it's weird that they combined it with the base, that you have to use that to make the base work. Strange design decision. So there's not that much to look at on the outside of the device. Um, we could read the manual, but what fun is that? It's actually quite a lot of fun. I love reading old manuals. You find all sorts of stuff in there that you wouldn't have known from any other source. Uh, but this is a video. We probably want to see the thing work. So let's go ahead and power it up. But before we fire this up, we need to get the pen ready. And let me explain what I mean by that. Modern tablets use pens that are either capacitive or I think sometimes inductive. And if you go back far enough, you find tablets that used resistive screens, which meant you could use any piece of plastic or other blunt object or even a fingertip in a pinch. This pen, however, is of the worst possible horror show variety. It takes batteries. I don't exactly know why pens back then took batteries, but it is a huge pain in the ass. So if you look uh, in the box here, there's these two awful, miserable little cells up here. Uh, they are Energizer 393s, a format that nobody is going to just have on hand at home, not even me. So I had to send away for a couple of these, and I'm sad to report that they did arrive just before I started shooting the video. So I can just put them in here, which is a bummer because it means I won't get to do this caveman style. See, before I spent money on batteries for this, I wanted to make sure it actually worked. So I took the cap off and looked at the contacts and they're big enough, I thought I could probably get some alligator clips on there. So I got my bench power supply and ran it up to 2.9 volts, clipped it on there, and sure enough, it worked. I was able to run the pen Evangelion style. Unfortunately though, I might mess up the contacts doing that so I can't justify it a second time. Power the stylus, Shinji, or the bench supply will have to do it again. All right, so now we are ready to start it up. The button on the front is not a soft power switch, which is not surprising given its age. Uh, instead, you just hit the 110 volts. So as we boot up here, we get the Hewlett Packard logo, uh, and then we're gonna get the OmniShare logo. And now we're ready to OmniShare. This is fairly readable to human eyes, but it's kind of tough to get a good shot of it on camera. Don't worry though, later in the video, you'll get a much clearer picture. So now we're booted and we're at the uh, desktop, as it were. There's not a whole lot of things going on here. Uh, so we've got uh, an in tray, and then we have a number of documents, uh, and then we've got these icons down the sidebar here. So for instance, I can uh, grab a document and I can drag it around here. Um, if I tap on the name, it'll allow me to rename it. It pulls up this uh, on-screen keyboard because this thing has no keyboard input, as I said. You can drag things into the trash, for instance. Uh, you can drag them to one of the sidebar icons. And those sidebar icons are the uh, viewer annotator, they're the fax machine, the printer, and the copier. And at this point, it would probably be a good idea to explain what this device is actually meant to be. The HP OmniShare is an interactive fax machine. I don't know if that's what HP called it, but functionally that's what it is. And I did find one book which described it as part of a genre of interactive fax technologies that were coming up in the world at the time. Although I couldn't figure out what the other ones were because Google Books only shows me some of the pages in the book. 
Once you see what this thing does though, Interactive Facts is a perfect name for it. The items on the desktop here represent documents, and then within each document there are pages. So we have the README document and the registration document, and then an unnamed one over here. If I double tap the first page of registration, which is very hard on this thing, it usually takes me about five tries, you can see that this is a scan of what appears to be a paper form. So this is an eight and a half by 11 page, and I can grab the scroll bar here to uh, slide up and down, now, when I first got in here, I tried just tapping on the page and dragging, and what I did instead is I scribbled on it, because I'm used to modern touch interfaces where, you know, you just touch and drag, a thing that I don't think anybody had invented until, like, the 2000s. When we scroll down to the end of this page here, it advises us to hit this icon to turn to the next page. Uh, there's page forward and back here. There's only a couple actions we can do on a document. We can zoom in, for instance, which, as you can see, takes quite a while for it to render. We can also rotate a document 90 degrees in any direction. And the final tools are the pen and the eraser. And those allow us to scribble on the document or erase uh, just our scribbling. So there's a few things you can do with those. Um, for instance, the included registration document actually expects you to use the pen tool here on the device to fill out the registration. So despite the fact that we're on a computer and we could actually type this in with a keyboard if we had one installed we're instead just going to write it on the screen like a barbarian now the reason for that is that the instructions here actually say you're supposed to flip through this paper document on this computer fill it out with the pen and then you drag it to the fax machine to fax it directly to hp to register your device so that's one thing that omnishare is capable of you can digitally annotate a document and fax it to someone but that's a pretty extreme use case for a dedicated device like this. So it'd be pretty silly to use it for just that. And sure enough, that's not really what it's for. It's just a bonus feature. The really interesting stuff happens when you have a second OmniShare. See, the idea is you're supposed to dial up somebody else who also has an OmniShare. And then once you're connected, you take one of your documents and you transmit it to them. Then once it arrives, they have a duplicate of that document, which is referenced back to yours. Now, when you're dialed up from your machine to theirs, if you pull up the document in the annotator and start scribbling on it, your scribbles appear at their end in real time. The idea with this is that you would be an architectural firm and uh, you would send uh, some blueprints over to a client and the client would get on their OmniShare and you get on your OmniShare and then the client would be able to go, okay, I just wanna widen this up here instead of having to go, uh, well, the room that's at the top, that's to the left of the big room, I wanna make the walls a little bit wider there you know, but not, not wider, like, you know, like from my perspective, wider. So just, just make it wider in a few different ways and just send me like five faxes with different kinds of wide rooms. That sucks, but it's what people were doing back then. So it would be a lot easier for the client to be able to just go, I want it like that. Now I can show you a demo of that, which is clipped from the Computer Chronicles episode that I found. I'll put it up here in the corner for a few seconds and I'll link it in the description so you can go watch the whole thing. But I'm not gonna be able to show it to you live because I only have one of these. They're meant to talk to each other and HP never made a software version of this that could run on a PC, even though I'm sure they could have. Uh, so I've got no way to show you what it does. The thing is, um, you've already seen what it does. I mean, it does faxing and annotation. If I plugged it into another one, you would just see it doing faxing and annotation over there. I could show you that when I scribble on this one, the scribbles appear over on that one, but I don't think we're really missing much by not being able to see that. I guess HP didn't think it needed to do more because they figured this was gonna be a killer feature, uh, which is kind of wild. I think they probably sold like 30 of these because this is not a killer feature. I mean, even at the time, I don't think this was a killer feature. I mean, people could buy PC software that did pretty much the same stuff as this. That's why I was looking it up, because I knew it was possible. Also, uh, that software didn't cost $2,500, which is what this setup cost. At that price, I mean, who was gonna invest in this? There'd be no point in buying one unless you knew you were gonna be working with a lot of people who had them themselves, and they weren't gonna buy one unless they knew they were gonna be working with a lot of companies that had them, so it was a chicken and egg problem. You could say that about fax machines or PC modems, but I mean, those were huge technological advances. Everyone who saw them knew these were gonna go places, especially because they were so much older than this. I mean, those are technologies from the 70s or earlier. I think the sole advantage that this thing might have promised was the audio span feature, which I will explain more on in a couple minutes, but I don't even think that was compelling enough to make this thing sell because you could get that on a PC as well. In other words, the reason I can't find a review of this in any magazine and I can't find any info on any website about it is because it's dumb and pointless and sucked so no one bought one. I don't like it either. 
So that would be the end of the video, and it would be a pretty boring video if I ended it there. Uh, but there are a number of interesting loose ends to tie up. First question, how do you get documents into it? I showed you all the tools this thing has. There are no authoring tools on the thing. You can make a new page and scribble on it, but that's it. So how do you get the files in here to send to someone? The answer to that is that you make them on your PC. Now this thing has several I.O. ports, and I guess conceivably HP could have made it compatible with a scanner so you could ingest documents, um, but I don't think there were very many parallel port scanners in 1994, and this thing doesn't have SCSI, so HP would have been hard-pressed to convince somebody to go buy a $1,500 scanner to pair with their $2,500 boat anchor that they'd already purchased, so that was a non-starter. Instead, the driver disk contains an emulated printer, which you install in Windows, and then from whatever application you're using, word processor, whatever, you print a file to the printer, which spits it out into an OmniShare proprietary file on the hard drive. You can then send it to the OmniShare. Now, there's a LAN port on the back here, so you would imagine you could send the files over the network. No, you can't. There's also PCMCIA slots up here, so you'd think you could put them on a flash card. No, you can't. In fact, the only way to move data on and off of this thing is over serial or uh, infrared IRDA, which is also basically serial. You'd think the Ethernet port and the PCMCAA slots would be active, but HP makes no mention of them in the documentation. Uh, I suspect they're things that they added and wanted to get working, but then they ran out of development budget. Frankly, I have a strong hunch that this was not the device's full potential, that HP had other plans for it that they ran out of money to implement and just put out something that did the bare minimum, which proceeded to flop, so corporate went, well, I guess nobody wants that, and then didn't finish it. Second question, how does this collaboration strategy work if you have to use the modem to connect to the other machine? How are you going to talk to the other person if you're on the phone with the modem? I mean, sure, you could buy two phone lines, but you couldn't sell this product on the assumption that everyone was going to do that. That wasn't going to fly. The answer comes from that AT&T voice span badge on the front. Uh, this is a technology that's largely forgotten called simultaneous voice and data, which does exactly what it says on the tin. There were a number of technologies for this back in the mid 90s, which allowed you to dial up from one modem to another and send data while talking on the phone at the same time. This was no joke, uh, it did actually work. And there were a number of technologies that did it. I've got a big video planned uh, where I'm gonna explain how all these worked and demo all of them. Um, but for the moment, what you need to know is that it did work. This really would have been super slick. You would have called up from this device to the other, you would have been scribbling on the screen, and the other person would be able to see it and talk to you at the same time over one phone line. It's really cool. So again, maybe HP thought the voice span feature is what was gonna make this sell, but you could get a modem for a PC that did the same thing. So. I still don't see what justifies the price tag and this being a discrete device. By the way, the uh, button on the front, that's for the voice span feature. When you hit the button, it just drops your call instantly. Third question, what does the copier icon do? Answer, it copies a document. That is to say, you drop a document on it and now you have a second copy of it. Why you couldn't just tap on the header and click copy or duplicate, I don't know. So finally, what is it? I mean, on a hardware software level, is this a bespoke Motorola 68K based integrated system or not? Uh, no. I do have some footage from when I first plugged this thing in, and as you can see, I got an error message when I first started it up in 80 by 25 text mode. That is a video mode unique to PCs, so this is definitely based on PC hardware. Of course, uh, it's still really small, so it can't be an off-the-shelf PC motherboard, uh, and we still have to wonder what the software is. Well, answers to those things were forthcoming as soon as I started working on this thing, because when I looked in the holes on the back, I saw a hard drive, and I knew immediately I was going to have to take it apart. You can't buy a 26-year-old information appliance with a hard drive in it and just turn it on. I mean, obviously God is going to strike your hard drive dead for your hubris. So you have to open it up, get the hard drive out, and image it. That's just good stewardship. So the first thing I did is I took the case off, gutted it, took the hard drive out, imaged it, and I immediately answered a lot of my questions. First question, what is it? It's a 486. It's got a tiny Texas Instruments 486 chip on the board. Otherwise, it's a completely custom, bespoke PC motherboard, uh, which I guess made sense because HP was rolling in money at the time, and so they could waste money making a completely unique PC with like a dual stacked motherboard just to make it a little bit smaller. I don't have a deep analysis of what's on the board because it's just jelly bean PC hardware. I mean, modem, nick, whatever, yawn. The hard drive is a completely ordinary for the time IDE 100 megabyte quantum, so I just plugged it into a USB adapter and ripped an image. Uh, by the way, you can find a link in the description to that image on Internet Archive along with the driver disk. So with access to the contents of the disk, I can now find out how the thing worked, and unsurprisingly, it's not very exciting. It runs Windows. 
they did a really good job of hiding the trappings of the OS, but Microsoft probably provided a version of Windows that was for this purpose. So I started digging into it to find out what they'd changed, and I was surprised to find out not much really. Looking at the any files and the included drivers and whatnot, it looked like fairly stock Windows with some pretty minimal modifications. I started thinking I could probably run this in an emulator. Well, here's that. It launched in DOSBox with almost no modifications. Uh, I did have to remove Smart Drive from the autoexec.bat in order to prevent it from hanging, but otherwise it just booted straight up into Windows, started the OmniShare software, and that was that. At first my mouse didn't work, uh, but that turned out to be because the pen operates with a special HP mouse driver that converts the pen inputs into mouse positions. So I just brought over the original mouse driver from a normal copy of Windows 3 and my mouse worked as a pen input. So at this point, the entire OS and software stack were all functional. I could open up a document, I could scribble on it with the mouse, um, I could even conceivably have faxed it to someone if I could get the modem to work. And that was where things fell apart. Um, I was hoping I could get an actual functioning OmniShare in emulation or even on a real laptop that I could plug into this thing so I could actually demo the software functionality fully, but I just couldn't get over this modem hurdle. No matter what I did, it always just came up and said that the phone line wasn't connected, which is just a generic error it gives anytime it can't reach the modem, it seems. I tried a number of real modems, including a couple that I knew supported the voice span feature, but nothing worked. I'm guessing it's looking for a very specific answer to like the modem version and stuff like that. I messed around with some files and I, I tried dumping the serial stream to see if I could make sense of what it was expecting, but nothing worked, so I just gave up. I mean, it's not really worth it to beat my head against it. Like I said, if I got it working, I'd just be able to scribble here and see the scribbles appear there. It's not too exciting. Two useless devices instead of one. Yeah, we did it. The one remaining customization I found intriguing was that HP had included their own monochrome VGA driver. Now, the original Windows 3 had a black and white video mode, but that was one bit CGA color, whereas this is 16 color VGA. It just maps all the colors to grayscales. This is presumably to make Windows look better on the monochrome LCD panel, but what's interesting is you can take this driver, drop it into a normal copy of Windows 3, and it will just work. It'll just convert all your colors to shades of gray. There are two interesting effects from this. The first is that the scroll bars in normal Windows programs now look like the OmniShare scroll bars. Now I'm told the reason for this is that Win16 video drivers had to implement pretty much the entire Windows graphics stack, which meant that they knew when they were drawing a scroll bar and could override the scroll bar graphics with their own custom ones. The other thing is that if you open up the Windows Color Picker, uh, it does fascinating things to the gradient. I think they're beautiful. I would think that any other program in Windows 3 that used a lot of colors would look pretty cool in this mode, but I couldn't really think of any offhand, so I didn't know what else to do with it. So there's only one other interesting thing I think I could do with this thing, which would be to take the pen driver, load it into a normal copy of Windows 3, and then put that back on this machine, producing a Windows 3 machine with pen input. Um, that's a cute idea, but in doing so, I would be modifying and thus destroying a historical artifact. And as much as I don't want this thing, and I'm going to get rid of it as quickly as possible to a good home, I wouldn't want to change it like that when I could just go and get a 486 tablet PC. I mean, they did make them. This device is a great example of what technology preservation is often like. Dead boring. I don't like this thing now that I have it. I don't really find anything about it very interesting but maybe it's the last one of its type in the world, and me buying it off eBay kept it from being forgotten forever. It is not, as it turns out, very cool, and the way it's built is not really all that cool. But even so, we should remember that this is a path that some major corporation thought we were going to go down at some point, and that tells us a lot about what the environment was like in 1994, that something like this was even seen as viable, to the point where they put this much R&D into it. And that software is now online, and will probably be online for many, many years, and anyone can go and look at it and find a lot of information about how this thing was designed, and who made it, and why they made it, if they care to look. There's a whole bunch of comments about all the files on the drive that they edited explaining things about the development history, and I'm sure you could pull all sorts of interesting facts out of there if you go and spend the time. For instance, in just my rudimentary review of this thing's files, I found that a lot of them referred to it as Pike, which I suspect was HP's internal code name for it. And I figure anything that had a code name during development deserves scrutiny by future historians. Archaeology is uh, probably always boring, but I think it's worth it. So I hope you had a good time watching this. Uh, if so, if you could subscribe, that'll let me know you want to see more stuff like this. Uh, also, if you want to help me get more stuff like this to show you, consider subscribing to my Patreon. Uh, everybody on there is sending me money that I'm using to buy things like this. Um, a lot of them haven't shown up in videos yet because it takes a while for me to get all the stuff together to make a video about something. But trust me, there's a bunch of stuff in this room that's going to be in future videos that you helped purchase. Thank you so much for your support.
I'd also like to specifically thank all the people who have joined my higher Patreon tiers since my last video, and that is Jeff Schumacher, Lem, Jay, hey Jay, and Richard Stevens. And of course, I want to thank everybody else who is enjoying my stuff. I couldn't do it without you. Thank you for watching. You're in the way.